Good to go? Good to go. Yeah. All right. Welcome everyone to uh, this webinar, Locational Data. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We have uh, Greg Lachlan. Hello, Greg. Hello, Adrian. <laughs> Who is a principal... What are you? I, I was know. a senior principal scientist um, in spatial modelling and director of geography at the ABS, and my first mm -hmm. job was a lecturer in geography at the ANU. Okay. I forgot to tell you about that one. Mm. <laughs> Probably in this, one of these buildings close to here, I imagine. Mm. Uh, it's been the old office of... Uh, and who's sitting next to me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hutchinson. <laughs> we also have uh, Ben here today, Ben Greenwood. Hi, Ben. Hi, Ben. Uh, ben, who's the technical lead of the uh, ANS uh, development team. Uh, so we're going to be talking about two aspects of uh, locational data today. That's the um, developments in the Australian Gazetteer, as well as uh, some complementary developments happening in the ANS software. That's why we've got Greg and uh, Ben here today. I don't think you've intro introduced yourself, Adrian. Uh, <laughs> That's well true. Adrian Burton. Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm one of the directors in AMS. And I'm really just here to talk to you about... Uh, we have to mouse that through. So, yes. <laughs> we'll be talking about a, a few things. I'll be just talking about the uh, data connections, about you know, why data that is connected is more valuable. Greg will talk to you about the uh, generally about ge geospatial and uh, in particular about the gazetteer. Uh, ben will follow that up with uh, what's happening in Research Data Australia, and then we'll talk about some new directions uh, into the future. <clears throat> All right. The the premise. Uh, why is ANS uh, interested in uh, geospatial or why are we promoting and supporting? Uh, it's part of the uh, adding value to data. Part of what ANS is, is the, the ANS mission is, is to um, support moves, general public policy moves to uh, elevate the data that sits behind research to be a primary output of research, to be uh, one of the uh, shared objects, and really that is to create better science so that it can be uh, integrated into new uh, data. We can test the, verify the scientific and other research claims based on the data, uh, and that the data itself is uh, more available, more, re more reusable. Um, that it's not just enough to really have it, to have it. Can't do, just having data, or data being there by itself is not really enough. Uh, it needs to be useful and it needs to be valuable. One of the values is when you can connect that data to other data. So data itself increases in value uh, when it can be integrated with other data or discoverable with another set of data. So really ANS is interested in making data more valuable by the, the connections with other data. Now, what, what are the basis of those connections? The basis of those connections are common attributes or common concepts. One very common concept to lots of things is the location. Lots of things happen, you know, well, most things happen somewhere, um, and lots of data reflect the fact that this observation happened here or happened in, in this region. So place itself is a, is a common uh, cross-cutting concept uh, across data. Time as well. Things happen at a particular time and uh, uh, can be of research interest just knowing which data was collected at, at what time. The projects that the data were, is related to is another cross-cutting thing that says, oh, that's part, this data was part of another project and therefore we can you know, infer things from it. The people involved are also... Um, another connection, connecting point, the field of the research itself, and uh, maybe it's just a particular scientific concept like salinity. So if that salinity is expressed in a common standard way, then you know, again we can discover data that is about salinity, and we can integrate two observations about salinity. 
So it's from a very broad view where there's lots of things, that, there's lots of very fundam uh, fundamental concepts that we're interested in promoting standard ways of, of uh, and easier ways of manipulating those concepts in data. And uh, the two scenarios we're really looking at here is how could I find things and see whether I want to use it in my research or the second one being how, if I find it, how could I integrate this with other data. So location is one of those key concepts that say, how can I find everything in, every, all the data about Kalgoorlie uh, or about a particular plot that I'm investigating? And the second thing would be, okay, having got that, how can I integrate two data sets uh, using the fact that they have a shared value uh, of location or, or some other um, shared concept. So in order to do that uh, at, at sort of large scales, then you know, there are standards and encoding standards and uh, we'll learn a little bit more about that here. But the basis, you know, the why, why we're interested in, is this um, idea that we can make our data more valuable by having these connection points and having those, those connection points uh, encoded in common standard ways and that's part of we talk about the Australian Research Data Commons. In order to have a commons there needs to be some common um, uh, values I suppose and uh, values in, a, in both senses. Um, so in my data if I'm talking about salinity or location and you're t talking about uh, salinity and location in your data, uh, how, what encoding, you know, what systems, what tools can make it easier to make those connections. So in general we're interested in those connections and making that easier. So that's why we, uh, ANS, had a partnership with um, both uh, Geosciences Australia and the Department of Resources, Energy and Tourism uh, to try and make it easier for researchers to include location information in their data. That project was the uh, Gazetteer of Australia. So Greg will be talking to us about that. But uh, even uh, before we get there, Greg is just going to give us a little bit of a, a basic tutorial in some of the concepts involved in um, geospatial data. Greg, you want to swap places? Yeah. And can I just use the space bar? Sure. Thanks. So. Thanks, Adrian. Um, <coughs> on the screen now, hopefully, is the geospatial page from Anne. So just Google Anne's geospatial, and you can have a look. There's a bit of a pun there. Where is geospatial? By that I meant where is it on our website? So some of the things we're talking about today uh, are in here. Um, now, before we get to the gazetteer, the machine component of the gazetteer has a long URL. Um, and it's too long to write down, I think. So um, we will undertake to put that URL up on um, this on the website under Geospatial. So get that out of the way now. I've only got two slides here, so I'll probably talk a little bit around um, some of these points. Now the first point might sound a bit twee, loosely means mappable, but there's more to that than might appear. Something in statistics, something that is mappable means it's continuous in space or smooth in space or for the statisticians in the audience, it's spatially autocorrelated. Now I'll give you an example of that. Elevation is mappable because a process has operated on it over millions of years to smooth things out. So unless you're in limestone country, an, an, an elevation at one point on the Earth's surface is going to be correlated to um, a point close to it. In other words, it's essentially a smooth and continuous thing. So let's think of something something that would be easy to map. Temperature, because it's a fluid, or occupies, is a characteristic of a fluid. Abrupt boundaries smooth themselves out, so temperature is an easy one. Salinity, elevation, all those sorts of variables that are continuous. But let's think of one or an example that is the opposite. If we were to take a photograph, an aerial photograph of cars in a car park, I would say that for most, unless something unusual is going on, um, like a parade, um, the correlation between colours of those cars will be essentially zero. So they're not mappable in, in a normal sense. So you couldn't really map the colours of cars in a car park. 
there is no reason to expect a black car next to a black car and so on. So the first point, I hope we've dealt with that reasonably well. It means that it is extensive in space and things that are close to each other are correlated or have similar values. Now, second dot point becomes a bit easier then. Okay, so what does geospatial mean? It means it's mappable. Things that logically have coordinates, like a trig point, which is the thing, those little black circles you see on cans on the top of mountains, street addresses, um, anyone who's got a smartphone knows all about that, your current location. So anything that has a coordinate, and these days the coordinates are usually given in terms of latitude and longitude, and there is a standard, uh, a standard um, datum, which is actually the centre of the Earth these days. Now, it's not just points that we're interested in when we talk geospatial. We're also interested in things that have boundaries. And you can think of dozens of things, suburbs, catchments, just all manner of social, economic and environmental things, things that can be expressed through postcodes. There is a long list of those sorts of things. But here are a couple that may not come to mind immediately. Things that are represented by pixels. Now, I'm thinking here of imagery out of planes, or imagery out of satellites, remote sensing, and in a few moments I'm going to show you that in modern geographic information systems, which is the technology that sits under geospatial, there is the power now to drape an image um, over, for instance, a map of the Earth and have that image fit um, very precisely. It's, it's, it's a very well-developed science, I suppose, or technology might be better. And then finally, things that are represented by lines. So, for instance, a paddock, if you're thinking in an agricultural sense, a paddock um, it could be represented by a boundary, it could be represented by a pixel, um, it could be represented by a line only in the sense if that line is actually joined up to make a boundary. So I'm thinking here of lines as linear features like drainage and streets, or for the fact matter, the edges of a building. So basically you have points, you have, I'm now going back to dot point two, we have points, we have polygons, we have pixels and polylines. They're the four things that make up um, geospatial. So think of a polyline, if you think of a braided stream, a stream which uh, has lots of little contributaries to it, they're, they're the things that could only be represented by lines. Now moving on, increasingly this, these examples I've given so far really relate to the physical sciences largely. But increasingly, social, economic, and environmental data, and government data as well, are being collected and generated with one or more of these dimensions, and I refer to the dimensions as these attributes. And you'll see that the Australian Bureau of Statistics now is no longer coding its social and economic stats to local government areas, which change all the time, by the way. Um, they code them to little stable blocks called mesh blocks. And so by aggregating those mesh blocks, you can essentially reproduce any shape you like. Therefore, you can effectively, uh, effectively cookie-cut statistics to any shape that you have in mind. Now, you couldn't do that five years ago. Increasingly, technology is, ena is enabling these dimensions to be put together. And by put together, I, I, I really do mean integrated. I'm going to give you an example that's a very brief one in a moment, where an analysis can be performed within a layer and between layers. And if those layers are social, economic, environmental, in other words, fundamentally different kinds of data, this is a potentially a very powerful area of research. Now, the example I've given here is from the physical sciences again. I apologise for that, but that's what I am. A satellite image of land cover draped perfectly on a map of geology. Imagine that. You would expect the land cover, the vegetation, and all the rest of the things that are on the land you would expect them to show some sort of correlation with the soil and rock that sits beneath that. But these days it is possible to drape an image, all kinds of images, over all kinds of base maps in just one or two steps. The other example, which is the one I'm going to give, is statistics on health versus income. They can now also be represented um, on the same surface. Now this image here is, is an example more or less of the, of the cutting edge um, of geospatial. Um, this is a real-time image, and in the middle, if I can um, just get this little mouse to do something. So <laughs> oh, now just, just move a bit of impedimenta here. Hopefully you can see. Now this is actually a top view or a plan view of a boat. That is a boat. 
So um, I've labelled that. I say here the boat is moving in real time, but in reality it's actually everything around the boat that is moving. The boat is stationary on the screen and... I don't know what happened there, but nonetheless we're back. So in fact the world moves past the boat in exactly the same fashion as if you looked outside of the boat. Now you also have, you can see there, that the blue is water, the yellow and green is land. So that is in this case what a base map is. So you can see that um, there's some sort of a channel marker here. This is water, it's going somewhere, in this case it's going out to Jervis Bay. But what we have here in red is actually a digital broadband radar image in real time. So it is confirming that the shoreline is indeed there and there. It's confirming that the shoreline is, is very accurately represented, but it's also showing you a number of features here that aren't on the map. So they are likely to be boats, things like that, things that perhaps may not ought to be there. So here we have an example of topography, which is in this case electronic charts. So I'm showing you this because hopefully it shows you the sorts of things that are possible. Now this is real time, the next example is not. So we have remotely sensed things that are in red that aren't on the map. They're boats, moorings, kayaks, and they're perfectly overlaid. Um, when this boat sneaks around the creek here, the radar, radar will bounce off this um, starboard marker here and show it whether it's in the right place or not. And if it's in the wrong place according to the map, then the, the radar image will be over here, and that is where the actual marker will be. The accuracy of this system is better than two metres. There's an example of a real-time geospatial system. Now here's another example which might be more germane to researchers. Here's an example I found. Um, we have the state of Maine here. And you see three different kinds of data being represented here. Um, in, in this analysis we have um, a population divided by area. The area is derived by the statistical boundaries. If you can see the mouse, and hopefully I'm not going over the top with its movement. These are the equivalent of our suburb boundaries, although they're very large suburbs, um, counties if you will. And the number of counts in the census has been divided by the area to give you a population density. And to make this realistic, in other words, to provide context, we have the ocean, we have lakes, and all other things. Now if you see um, at the left-hand side of the screen in orange, there is nothing now to stop us adding roads, income, transport, models now. I say models, I say transport models. It is now possible with modern GIS, that's Geographic Information Systems software, to do analysis between layers and across layers and within layers. So you could do analyses about, you know, what is the relationship, for instance, between income, health and population density? Uh, there is virtually no limit. And uh, as Adrian said at the top of this um, webinar, there are, there are models now that are very well developed and in the spatial industry and geospatial industry the models are very well developed so that if you bring in a data set that is compatible it will fit, it will know where it exists in the real world and you'll be able to do analyses and operations on it. So in other words, if we were to put towns on this map of Maine, the towns would know where they are and they would know their populations relative to this other source of population data which was actually aggregated to these county boundaries. So there's an example, hopefully closer to the research sector. Now I'm going to just give two very brief examples of the Gazetteer of Australia and we're well ahead of time. Um, so I'll digress for a minute. When I was Director of Geography at the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the Gazetteer was just a great long paper list of official place names in the country of which there are about 300 and 310,000 plus there's of course alternative names so it adds up to about 600,000 entries in that database I think that's right. Um, so over a period of years and with the involvement of Geoscience Australia, Office of Spatial Policy and CSRO I need to mention we took it from a essentially a paper-based product and produced a web product which you see here. Now that first URL, I think you can write that one down. Um, it's, it's fully operational now and I'll show you a couple of examples. The second one is a little bit too much um, to write down but we will put that up on the ANS website if it's not already there. So what we have done and what I'm going to show you now is an electronic uh, interface. It's a web interface. 
It has basic map type functionality, not quite the sort we saw in the last two examples, but it's a, a big step forward from, from where it was a few years ago, just a great long list, which you had to pay significant money to get, I might add. So now in the next two slides, and there are only two, I'm going to just show you two of the typical uses. These are very basic uses. There is, there's the Gazetteer of Australia 2, that's what we're going to call it. It has a map interface, as you can see, very much like a Google map inf interface. It has open street maps. Now all, um, all I've done here is enter the name, and basically you enter a name in here. I have not defined a feature type. Feature types are things like coasts, treat points, bays, um, homesteads, urban areas. So I've not done that. I've just entered, I have entered the word orange in there and up it has brought all of the returns, or should I say the first 50 returns. There are, as you can see, 111 results. And I think for, for most people, if, I'm, if we're thinking entry level, this is how it's going to be used. When you hover your mouse over this orange creek here, which is a homestead, um, its equivalent will be highlighted over here and vice versa. You can download them, you can save them, and over in this box here, I'm trying to keep the mouse movements down a bit, you can find a little bit more about Orange Creek. You can save this all, you can sort it, you can do all those basic things. And as you can see, it's covered with a CC by license, so all that's required to use this is citation. The next slide, which is my last slide, um, shows a different kind of query in this one. Um, I've, entered, I've actually entered a feature type, and here I've entered airport, as you can see, and I've restricted the geography, so I've done two things in one operation. You could do all of Australia. All I did was draw a box and enter the feature type. As you can see, there's a, it's a called a polygon search. That's the polygon over there, and it's brought up all of the airports that are inside that polygon, and again, you can download them as a comma-separated variable file, so on. Of course, the metadata comes with them. Ah, oh, yes. There is one other thing. Just before coming into this presentation, apart from sharing a few gags which we didn't know were going to air, I got an email from um, the consultant, Lucas Foxton. And in that email, he um, is outlining some um, possible future developments and improvements of the Gazetteer, which will involve CSIRO, the people in CSIRO doing Gazetteer work, the SIWS people, Geoscience Australia and the Office of Spatial Policy and uh, although it would not be right for me to talk about those plans, there are some pretty sort of um, heady looking things that might be done with this software to integrate it with other efforts around the world and to make it available for further use, further development. So again, as those things happen, we will let you know a little bit more about that. Over to um, Research Data Australia and um, the the impact of, of spatial and geospatial um, metadata. Um, Research Data Australia, I'm sure most of the people in the audience are familiar with, um, as a portal for Australian researchers to discover data um, and the connections, uh, which Adrian was alluding to earlier. Um, in terms of uh, how geospatial is used in, in Research Data Australia, um, we have a big emphasis on discovery and, and being able to discover something based on where it is. In, in the world is, 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 is a very natural way for people to, to, to browse. Um, Research Data Australia, I think, has 75,000 records in it at the moment, probably a little more than that. Um, and so finding efficient ways to, to look for, for data that's interesting to you as a researcher or, or, or being able to browse is, is very important. So um, Doing that based on, on where, the, where the data was collected, if it's a collection, where the data is based or housed, um, is, is, is a very uh, natural, natural thing for pe people to do. Um, furthermore, adding to the, to the aspects of discovery, um, once you are looking at, at a collection, for example, um, I've got a, an example on the, on the slide on the right there of population genetics of a starfish in the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific Ocean. Now that's a, that's a pretty sizable area of the Earth's surface. Um, and so based on that alone, um, you might not know the applicability of, of that uh, data set to, to something that you're interested in. But as you can see, you know, the record has been encoded with quite rich metadata there as to where um, 
where, where the data was collected, I think, is, is what that's displaying, the coverage. Um, and that would give you a, a lot more precise and, and a more natural um, way, to, way to view where that might be. Um, on top of that, how, how, how we get that information into Research Data Australia at the moment um, is through, through our providers, um, most of whom are, are providing it through a, an automated process and, and exposing uh, records that they have on their site. But what we've, what we've considered is, is how, to, how easy it is for those providers to actually capture or enrich, um, enrich their records with that data. At the moment of our collections, I think about 65% 60, um, will have some form of location or spatial information describing where the record is or, 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 or what, it, what its coverage is. Um, but we're obviously looking for ways to enrich that and, and, and increase that proportion. Um, and as part of that initiative, um, we will be releasing fairly shortly, I think early next week, um, uh, the ANS location capture widget. Um, effectively, it's a, it's a very small snippet of, of software that allows you to, um, to provide a very rich interface to, to, capture, um, to capture spatial information. And I think if I can pull it across, we can have a quick look. Let's see if that's going to work. That looks good. Um, Effectively, um, if I pull up the demo, it's probably a better idea. Um, this tool allows, as, as Greg was discussing, the, the concept of placing a point or a marker on the map, um, and immediately in one click, you've, you've captured that information in a, in a sort of a machine formatable way. Similarly, to draw a region or an area, um, in this is more than one click, but uh, we very quickly captured that area. Um, in, in light of uh, the availability of the Gazetteer of Australia, which this label needs to be changed to, um, you can also search for, for places. Um, so for example, I can probably see Mount Ainsley from here in Canberra, and we'll come up with Mount Ainsley, Australian Capital Territory. And in two clicks, again, we've, we've captured that information. Um, similarly, to complement the Gazetteer, we've got Google Maps uh, integration. So uh, Google has an idea of where it thinks Sydney is. Um, I think it's just a big square around the CBD. Um, so that may not be as necessarily uh, as rich a quality as what's coming out of the, the Gazetteer, but it, it does give a fallback and, and, and uh, a separate option. Um, there will be, in terms of the Gazetteer's results, uh, we're just doing keyword searches here. Um, if you required more, a, a better way to drill down through it, then, then obviously we'd suggest using um, the interface that Greg uh, discussed earlier. Um, this is really a, a lightweight, very quick way of being able to integrate it. So effectively, to create this form, um, which is just obviously an example of, of, a, of a use case, um, we've pasted three lines of code um, and that, that's generated the form. And I know we don't have a, necessarily a technical audience, um, but so any, any person with very basic web development um, knowledge will be able to implement this into a form um, very quickly and easily. Um, so that form would typically be uh, a part of a deposit workflow into an archive? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, uh, it's very flexible. Um, any, uh, aside from having to be web-based, um, any application workflow um, would be able to would be able to add that um, and capture that information, whether it's you know at a, at a library level actually enriching it based on some soft co or so, some hard copy information, or whether it's uh, part of a, an application that a researcher is actually using and they can capture in real time where you know where their observations might be or, or whatnot. Um, the limitations, I suppose, are um, <coughs> we, we're looking in, in two dimensions. We're working on Google Maps, um, which uh, you know, is, is obviously just a cross-section of what you can be, be doing with, with geospatial information. Um, in terms of other things happening at ANS with spatial, um, we will be, we've, we've had a bit of a review of the way that we, um, we do search and discovery. Um, and we will, we've, we've had a, a good look at the algorithms and the search, um, the search capabilities that we have. Um, they, will, they have been tweaked in light of, of, of uh, various, various input, both from within and, and outside of, of ANS. Um, we're expecting that will provide a much richer um, set of results. So when you're, when you're searching for a, search, uh, for a certain region, um, 
things that are most applicable to that region might come up first and, and further down you might get things that are, are only vaguely related um, and that's come about as you know in light of, of some of the new um, capabilities of the gazetteer um, and also just some algorithmic uh, enhancements. Ben, could you, um, would it be wise to go back and see what the gazetteer would have brought back to Sydney? Yeah. Uh, and uh, which of this, I think it's going to get a lot of use. So, um, the what we've what we've tried to do. Um, so let's do that search for Sydney again. We will get heaps of results. Um, we've obviously got a, a lot more limited um, interface here. I mean, it, it's lightweight, um, but they will give you, uh, I think, in order of, of, of s suburbs, city areas, um, and move down to. You know, I'm sure there will be Sydney. Uh, different Sydneys all scattered around the country there might be points in, in, a, in a, random, a random sort of area we've tried to leave those suppressed down to the bottom and give you um, what we can infer might be the most um, active so can a user spread. click on one of those and get something yeah. so Sydney Cove for example oh that's that's just wonderful which is uh, a lot richer than if you were to just type Sydney and get the Google box which covers you know the entire the entire region um, got a question on the screen over there I was wondering if the Google choice on the widget would enable selection of international as well as Australian locations. So yes, we, we're using the Google Maps API, so um, if we look for Budapest, Hungary, we'll similarly get that, that ability. Um, you wouldn't have that level of um, uh, parity, I suppose. Uh, the, the Australian Gazetteer is going to give you much more accurate and, and richer results within Australia, um, but that's why we've left it in there as, as a fallback. Um, that you, know, you can call the fallback or additional functionality if you want, um, but the ability to, to capture international results, and that's simply a query against the Google Maps API, um, and, and the data quality will be based on, you know, based on how Google's capturing that. Um, Greg, a question on international activities to federate gazetteers. Do you, would you like to make a comment on that? Um, The short answer, I think Sam um, asked that one, Sam Searle, um, the answer is yes. Now, um, I haven't got any details from uh, Lucas Foxton. Uh, there are just a whole bunch of things that are being um, facilitated by the Office of Spatial Policy. I think um, there's a couple of things. I, I know that discussions have uh, taken place with the, the custodians of the data sets, which are the various state mapping authorities, um, to use the Gazetteer transactionally, in other words, to use it to update the Gazetteer in real time, and that, that I understand is going well. There's um, talk already about integrating the Marine Gazetteer into it, um, and beyond that, um, all I saw was um, from Lucas, and I know he's, he's probably listening and probably wondering what I'm going to say next, and so am I, but um, there's efforts to integrate it with the United Nations spatial data infrastructure projects all around the world. That's probably all I can say about that at the moment. Yeah, um, it's, so the question was, you know, what are the, um, what uh, initiatives are, uh, are afoot to integrate this into, you know, other international gazetteer work. Uh, the first thing is it was designed to do this because the part of the specification for the project was that it would um, be based on you know the current open standards and the current the you know supported you know, international standards organisations um, you know the ISO standards that, that are out there um, and that are supported by the United Nations um, and you know, other international mapping groups. So we have. Uh, I think it's probably, uh, I can be corrected, but uh, it's the only instance of a working gazetteer that is fully compliant to those international standards. I mean, they've only been, they were finalised and invented as we were doing the project. I remember that, you know, the specification so came, came in, you know, about three quarters of the way through the project and we were madly scurrying in order to, in fact, we extended the project in order to enable that. So. From the design point of view, it has been designed for this, and obviously, you know, you'd want to have it integrating into our next door neighbours, so New Zealand and Mauritius, or you know, whoever the other close neighbours of Australia might be, and uh, obviously into the uh, you know the global view. 
and uh, the CSIRO have uh, already um, got some um, research and implementation initiatives you know, for, for that global standard of uh, gazetteers and for the integration based upon that global standard. Um, I see a question here from my friend Paul Tillersley. Um, it says, it looks like each feature in the gazetteer um, is a point, as inter alia. I would expect entries like the Coral Sea to have a shape file or polygon associated with it. Yes, Paul, that's um, one of the things that I did fail to mention is that in the email from uh, Lucas, uh, there was um, proposed high-level integration with the Australian um, standard uh, ASDD, Australian Spatial Data Directory. And so, yes, of course, there is, there is nothing in the system that limits it to points. The only reason that that's the case now is that the custodians simply have those points there. We will add, or not we, but all kinds of polygon boundaries will be added to that, I expect, in the future, Paul. The, um just, but just to, to be clear here, this video you know, is a, one of these, it's an infrastructure project from ANS. Uh, ANS had the choice of sort of inventing, you know, just doing a, a, a gazetteer if we wanted. Uh, but that was not the, the route that we took. It was a partnership with, you know, these long-lived mapping agent and geoscience agencies, you know, whose it's part of their charter to do these things. So we partnered with them to create the, the uh, uh, or extend you know, their infrastructure facilities in such a way that would be optimized for research so this really is designed to for research groups to be able to you know use the machine to machine um, interfaces into this uh, gazetteer to really ramp up the capabilities of their own GIS uh, research uh, tools uh, and for example the the widget thing that um, that uh, Ben showed us. So uh, we've partnered with the with these um, you know, long-lived Australian government uh, agencies in order that this be a part of the Australian uh, infrastructure and optimised, if you like, for the research infrastructure. Um, the only thing there is that they're, they're both Commonwealth agencies. Uh, of course, the information from this comes from states. So behind all this, the sustainability. The ownership of it is owned by a few high-level committees. The Committee for Geo Names of Australia, something like that. Um, CGNA. The, yes, the CGNA uh, are the uh, group of state stakeholders that own the uh, and, and maintain the, the base location information, and in partnership with the Commonwealth, um, make it available through this tool. The Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping is the other. Mm unit. I wonder um, if, if there's sufficient interest in the audience on its extension and further development. I see that uh, Lucas Foxton is, um, is there. I wonder whether Lucas would like to um, elaborate on, on, on this. We can hear from Lucas. Are you happy to do that, Lucas? I don't know whether he thinks he's uh, muted. And no, I agree. Ah, yes. Okay. And look, thank you for that email. I wonder if you just um, just run with this, uh, Lucas, a bit further and maybe go back to Paul's um, question about polygons because in, in my part, I, I talked about the different kinds of spatial data and I know all around the country people are interested in you know polygon, polygons and, and rasters and vector layers, all sorts of things. So do you want to say a bit about that, please, Lucas? Uh, sure. Um, before I do, I should actually also mention I was involved with this only at the very tail end in terms of doing uh, some minor redevelopment and then uh, the implementation of the solution. Um, Maritz van der Vlucht, who's also in the audience uh, today, uh, project managed uh, the initiative. Uh, so I'd also welcome comment from Maritz. Uh, he uh, feels he likes that uh, At the moment, we're in uh, discussion with uh, a number of parties, most of them uh, from within CSIRO uh, around potential future development of the Australian Gazetteer but also potential uh, future integration of uh, the Australian Gazetteer uh, not only with uh, the Indonesian Gazetteer uh, but also um, uh, into uh, the UN SDI Gazetteer framework 
So we can align uh, with that particular framework and then integrate our gazetteer into um, other uh, world gazetteers that are coming online that's going to actually provide um, an official, not only national capability, but global capability uh, in that space. So that's sort of the general uh, discussion that's happening at the moment, and, and don't quote me on any of this, uh, but it's, it's looking very favourable, and within the scope of uh, an initiative that I'm currently approaching around uh, what you mentioned, the Australian Spatial Data Directory, which is really a, a spatial metadata catalogue, if you like, and the gap is here in essence, is uh, a spatial data set that can be referenced by uh, the ASDB. Um, there is potentially scope for undertaking uh, uh, the next round of enhancements, essentially upgrading and, and enhancing and drawing upon additional capability that has been built into the underpinning open source product of the Gatsby team, uh, which is um, a product called GeoServer. But also, um, together with that, drawing upon advancement that subsequently happened with uh, especially the, the Open Geospatial Consortium or, or OGC uh, set of standards that's relevant to the Gazetteer. And there's three in particular that are uh, of greatest relevance and actually of greatest utility um, in what we're doing and, and Ben's certainly drawn on one of those. Um, that one is um, called Web Feature Services or WFS. There's another one called um, Web Map Services, WMS and one called um, Web Coverage Services or WCS. And uh, yeah, the latest versions of those three standards actually offer us um, uh, a lot more additional functionality than um, what the current version of GeoServer offers us upon which uh, the current version of Australian Gas here is predicated. So we're hoping to be able to draw upon that uh, at a point in the near future. I'm talking about um, things that actually Adrian mentioned in his first slide. So, for example, um, WMS, Web Map Services, in its current version, which is 1.3.0, now not only enables us to um, plot points uh, within two-dimensional space, but also to um, plot polygons in, in, in two-dimensional space, but actually also in three-dimensional space. So now we can specify uh, elevation as well as um, uh, two-dimensional qualities in terms of plotting, uh, plotting places location. But um, even beyond that, there's the possibility of doing that four-dimensionally. So doing it, um, uh, plotting, plotting points uh, not only uh, two-dimensionally on a map and also in terms of specific layers of elevation, but also at uh, different points across time. So an example of that, that might be, um, somebody might be interested, for example, in uh, ozone <laughs> concentrations at different elevations at a particular point in space, say over Sydney Airport, to take an example. Not only may they be interested in, in understanding that at a, at a point time equals x, they may also be um, uh, interested in understanding that uh, at a point um, uh, t equals x plus whatever, uh, or at multiple points in the future. So we're hoping that into the future we can actually build not just a two-dimensional capability, but actually a four-dimensional capability that includes a consideration of uh, elevation, both positive and negative, and uh, also time. So uh, that, that's one example of uh, what we're looking to do. But there's, uh, at the moment, we're, uh, we're, we're actually dreaming big. There's uh, so much possibility uh, that stands before us, and of course, as always, we need to, uh, to address those things that are a priority to the community, first and foremost, uh, and then um, and certainly look at uh, that into the short term and then uh, uh, work out what we approach aspirationally beyond that point. Uh, okay, um, look, uh, thank you very much, Lucas. That was, um, that was terrific. I wonder, um, Modit, um, do, you, um, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, thank you very much. That, uh, that was very well covered, um, uh, but, but I can say that uh, having not seen um, Hands have done with the Gazetteer services. I also am very, very impressed not only the utility but also uh, the usability of, uh, of the demos to be shown in the future. Hey, thanks, Moritz. Good. I think uh, we don't have any more questions on the Gazetteer, so we might move on. Is that right? Two. Two, two, two okay. quick questions. Yep. Um, Sam Searles mentioned uh, possible confusion in the naming of the of the tool. Um, I'll take that as, as definitely as a comment. Um, in 
in the ANS uh, RIFCS schema, we have a uh, concept of coverage and location as, as um, separate attributes of a, of a data record. Um, and and you know, call it, calling it one and not the other, um, we'll have a discussion, I think, of the, probably a little bit later today. And, uh, and nail that one down before we put it out to release next week. Um, the second question was from our colleagues in Canberra. Um, is the widget available uh, to researchers to set their own boundaries or is it for the data centre admins to add once the data set has been deposited to a repository? Um, I think um, with respect to that, it, it, it's entirely um, contingent on the workflow um, that, that an institution or a researcher is using. Um, the tool, as I mentioned, is, is completely open source and it's all based on um, open standards and, and the code's fully released. So if, if a researcher uh, had a use case to put the widget in, in an application that, they, that they're that they using, or, or um, you know, a data center admin uh, was looking to enrich records as they entered the, 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 the repository, um, it could be used in either of those settings quite, quite easily. Yeah, the idea there was that we had, um, this was something that uh, was available for people manually depositing a collection description with ANS, which is a, a tool that we were developing anyway, but uh, not a very small proportion of our, uh, our records about co data collections are actually manually crafted you know, within the ANS environment. Most of them are crafted back uh, at the different data archives and data repositories that that uh, send records to us. So the first thing we thought, okay, well, uh, you know, how can we uh, enable, you know, spatially enable those descriptions um, further back in the process? And then if you can give this widget to the people who are providing, you know, the, the research groups, and theoretically this is a great thing to have, you know, on, on the little laptop that you've got whilst you're making the, um, the observation in the creek. Uh, so, you know, as far back as we can push this into the research process, the better. And this is just one example of a widget, you know, there will be other ways to integrate directly into the uh, Gazetteer and other spatial, you know, reference data sets uh, way back into the, um, into the research process. And remember, and this part of it is just about the discovery part, you know, describing your data set that it has this coverage. There are lots of applications of this actually within the data set itself. Um, which you know, will be uh, enabled by the uh, Gazetteer. Before we move on to the next part, uh, Greg, uh, who was, uh, well, let me say first that from an ANS point of view, Greg Lachlan has been the, the project coordinator for the uh, Gazetteer of Australia 2.0, uh, and we thank him very much for his persistent efforts and uh, his expertise. Uh, who, who else did you work with? Uh, Great. Well, protocol would have me um, thanking you first, but um, <laughs> I've got uh, yeah that that's um, it was nice uh, nice those comments uh, modits and uh, yeah I, there's no one happier than me to see that that great big paper list turn into something as as pretty as this and then <coughs> see that little widget extension and how quick it was. Now I, I would like to thank um, a couple of people, in fact two from Pride Enterprise, which is uh, Modits van der Flucht from Mercury Project Solutions. And the, the programming team down in Tasmania called Geometry. I hope I've got that right. But here in Canberra, from the Office of Spatial Policy, um, Helen Owen and Chris Body and John Weaver were just fabulous. And without them, this truly would not have happened. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, let's move on to uh, directions. Uh, really, this is our first kind of webinar around uh, geospatial, but it's part of a... Um, an agenda, a geospatial agenda that uh, we're pursuing, and it's not just ANS, I mean, this is just happening in society. People, you know, it's you know, taking over your phone, uh, it's taking over everything. Um, so we're just reflecting the, the changes that are happening in society. What is that? How is ANS responding? Well, we've got more resources, there are more web pages, guides, and tools. Um, for example, the widget that uh, we saw today will be on the ANS website for download as of uh, next week. We have a software release, I think, in about 10 days. So within two weeks, I imagine that sh uh, should be available on the ANS website. Uh, there are a number of projects, development projects, that ANS has been involved in and it continues to be and you know, uh, more projects in the future. So that. Uh, Gazetteer project that we talked about today is one ANS project. 
Uh, we also have a very big project called the Spatial Information Services Stack, uh, SIS, which uh, is really about, okay, if I'm a serious uh, geospatial project and I want to run my own GIS system, then how do we do that? Well, then uh, that project has developed a whole stack of tools to be used there. So that project has just completed, I saw uh, last week, and uh, so the project report goes up there. The um, output of that project and all its tools will also be available on the website. Um, we have a number of other uh, applications, tools, uh, projects in ANS and in, in, relation, in collaboration with Nectar. So there are a number of geospatial projects uh, on the boil here, and so you'll see the uh, outputs of those projects on the ANS website and, and actually in use in these research projects. Um, there's ANS software. We, we saw a couple of updates that have happened now, and we will be uh, increasing, uh, continuing that optimization of the uh, geospatial capability of ANS uh, software. Uh, we continue again the support and community building, um, so workshops working with different communities. Um, as a part of that, we have a series of uh, webinars, geospatial uh, webinars. This is the first in a series. Uh, there'll be another walkthrough of the ANS software on the 6th of December, just uh, after the release. Uh, the, uh, so if you have people who want to um, be walked through all the, the uh, functionality of the ANS software, not just the geospatial stuff, but uh, everything. That uh, webinar will happen on the 6th of December. We have uh, a few uh, to, to be confirmed uh, webinars. So uh, Ben Searle of the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, has agreed in principle to uh, talk to about the uh, new ABS spatial framework. Uh, and that's possibly into next year. Um, so that's a, a more uh, applying geography uh, throughout uh, that kind of statistical uh, view of the world. Uh, so that's a, uh, another interesting uh, application of uh, geospatial. We will, uh, Ryan Fraser, I hope he's listening, uh, Ryan from the SIS team, because he hasn't, doesn't know this yet, but we would like them to report on that important uh, CIS project, so that again uh, early next year, uh, plus there are a couple of other uh, the other projects that I said, so stay tuned on this uh, channel, on the Geospatial Webinar channel, we've got uh, quite a few things uh, lined up. Today. <laughs> well, as long as, you, <laughs> as long as you keep watching the same programs again and again, yes, really 24 hours a day. Um, so yes, uh, into next year we hope that this will be um, part of uh, support. And uh, can I just put it out there, if, if you've got any ideas of what might be done as part of this community building, general capability building, or if you've got some uh, tools or things that you'd like to highlight through this channel, we are very, very keen uh, to find out more from, from you as well. Are there any late questions? Uh, otherwise we're about, we're coming into the home straight here. Where can we get the widget from? From the ANS website. Can I plug geonext.com.au? Oh, oh, can I do a plug for the... Yes, okay, yes, sorry. I thought it was something we were going to do. Plug in, yes. <laughs> Let me start again. Can I plug the geonext.com.au, the future of geospatial conference in February 2013? Of course you can. No. Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll mention that. Thanks, Moritz. There's a, um, so the future of geospatial conference in February 2013. In fact, there's also a geospatial gov. Yeah, spatial, spatial, gov. Gov. spatial at gov. Next week. Is next week. So if you're interested in uh, the general area, there's a conference here in Canberra as well. So that uh, Moritz wanted to bring our attention to geonext.com.au. Good. Uh, so if you want to follow this, uh, we have uh, a geospatial page on, on the ANS website, so that would basically be the spot to follow that. If you're interested in ANS uh, software development, you could contact services at ANS, or you could follow Greg on... No. <laughs> on my motorbike. <laughs> Follow Greg on his boat in Java's Bay. <laughs> if you have the, the right uh, tools. 
All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Greg. It's been uh, an interesting chat. And uh, thank you, everyone uh, in the audience, for um, uh, coming along. I suppose that's not the right word in the new uh, world. And thanks in particular to Moritz and Lucas, who were put on the spot to um, say stuff during the thing. Thanks for that, and uh, we'll see you at, uh, at the uh, following geospatial uh, geospatial uh, webinars. And a little thanks to our uh, technical guru, Alex, Alexander Hayes. Thanks, man. All right, see you soon.